Hey, what's going on? Ray Delvecchio here from WebsiteProfitCourse.com. Let's talk today about image file types. If you're experienced with websites or you deal with photography, this is something I'm, that I'm sure you've thought about, but I think most beginners overlook a few of the, the really simple basics. So that's what I want to quickly go through today. I'll teach you the difference between the most common formats and how to choose the best one for both quality and file size. And I'm going to walk you through a few examples and how I use Photoshop to save these images. So the most popular one by far is JPEG. And any image that you've gotten off a digital camera is likely of this format. And image formats can kind of be divided into two large camps, and that's lossy compression and lossless compression. And all that has to do is whether the information within the photo is lost or kept intact. And for JPEG, it's a lossy compression method. You know, there's gradients. You have when you're dealing with real world world photos, you don't have sharp transitions. It's not like you're dealing with a flat image. So that data can be compressed into a smaller file size, and you have control of how much quality you want in the end product. So you can kind of choose whether you want more quality and a higher file size, or you want to drop that file size as low as possible, and the quality doesn't really matter that much. That's ultimately going to come down to what you're using the image for. But for web, I'm all the time shooting for about 100 kilobytes max for a photo. And when you download a JPEG, either from a digital camera or from a free stock photo site like unsplash.com, they're going to give you the highest resolution photo. Sometimes they're you know, five or 6,000 pixels in width or height. And that could equal about five megabytes in size. And that's important if you're trying to optimize a website you want it to load as fast as possible, especially for people who don't have the fastest internet connection. Now the next file type is PNG. This is a lossless compression method. And as we just talked about, this is pretty much the complete opposite of JPEG where it's best for minimal color palettes. So you'll usually see a logo converted to a PNG format and that's going to give you the best optimization. And the other cool thing about PNG files is that you can include transparency. They have a channel where you can either do fully transparent or a partially transparent portion of the image. So anytime you have an image that has well-defined sharp edges and doesn't have a wide variety of colors, you're likely going to want to use a PNG file. And the other one that's similar to PNG is GIF. You might pronounce it GIF. And they're very similar in that they're both lossless compression that give you transparency. And the one advantage to GIFs is that you can save multiple images in the file and that allows you to do animations. So if you, you know, add up everything that we just discussed here, my decision making process is pretty simple. If it's a very complicated real image, I'm going to use a JPEG and I'm going to try and shoot for 100 kilobytes. If it's a logo file or a flat image that has transparency, I'm going to use a PNG. And if I need animation, then I'm going to go for a GIF. So those are the fundamentals that I wanted to discuss. So let's jump into Photoshop and I'm just going to show you a couple examples of images and look into the editing process. Here's a JPEG photo of my backyard garden. And fun fact, when I moved in, this entire area was 100% grass. Over the course of two to three years, I turned it into this hardscaped area that has vegetables, landscape plants, a fire pit. And I'm still not done with it. I generally, you know, take on a small project, add on to it, or, or do something else, expand it every single year. And I just think that that's the best way to work out. You know, going to the gym, to me, is a waste of money. I'd rather take on a home project like this, where at the end of it, not only have you exercised, but you've also improved your living situation. So I always save these files using the Save for Web tool. And I notice right now this is in the, this is a legacy tool. So if you go to File, Export, Save for Web, that's how you can get to it. And I usually use the shortcut, which is Alt, Shift, Control, S. There might be, because it's legacy now, there might be a newer way to do this. And if you know about this, let me know in the comments because I still use this to this day. So like I said, I'll just do the, the keyboard shortcut and bring up this tool. And another weird thing about my computer, I haven't figured this out yet. The weights, I have three monitors, and I thought that one of the monitors was showing the whites of a photo as yellow, but certain programs actually show it bright wh white, whereas Photoshop, it's a little bit dull. And you can see the difference here. I don't know if you can, but <laughs> the, uh, 
the white fence is way whiter in the safer web window than it is in the Photoshop window. I have no idea why that is, but <laughs> I'm just gonna uh, move on to this. So this is giving you the, the preview of the image, and on the right hand side here, this is where you can choose your file types. So right now you can see it's set to JPEG, but if you want to change that to either GIF or PNG, you can do that. And this is whether it's an 8-bit or 24-bit PNG. So if it's less color, you could probably get away with a PNG 8. And over here, this is where you set the quality. So you can go between 0 and 100 on the quality. And if we drop it down to 0, I mean, you'll, you can see how this pixelates. And down here is where they give you the file size. You can see that this file right now at 0% quality is 182 kilobytes. And over here is the image size. So you can either change it by percent or you can change it by pixels. So if we drop this down to 50%, you can see that the image changed to 47 kilobytes. And if I bring this quality back up to about 50, 50 to 60, it's now at 150 kilobytes. So these are the tools that you can play with to figure out the right combination, like I said, of the quality that you want based on the application that you're using the image for and the file size to optimize for speed. And I, for web, I normally like to make sure images are around 700 to 800 pixels width. Anything more than that to me is unnecessary unless you specifically want people to download high quality images. But if you're just inserting an image into a blog post or a page, that usually is good enough. And then for the quality, I, I generally hover around 50 to 60. That to me is a good trade-off. And it all depends on the type of image. So, some images look pretty good when you're down at quality 30, whereas others, you can tell that they're highly pixelated and that might come across as a real crappy image. But one thing I want to do here is switch this to PNG so you can see how much bigger a PNG file is at that same size. So right now we're at 150 kilobytes on this preview. And if I change that to PNG 24, that bumps that up to almost 900 kilobytes. So you can see that PNGs are not optimized for these very complex images. The next one here is the logo for my website, websiteprofitcourse.com. I created this, you know, I'm very basic when it comes to graphic design. I got into websites through code and the tech side. And I learned Photoshop actually as a freshman in college. It was one of my favorite classes because I thought Photoshop was some of the coolest software that I had ever used. But when I was learning graphic design, I, and I really learned graphic design myself, I, I'm not even close to a professional graphic designer. That is by far what took me the longest. So eventually I transitioned to doing almost all my graphics as flat images. I don't want to do any fancy stuff because I'm just trying to get things done as fast as possible. So obviously for my domain name, Website Profit Course, I wanted to combine websites and money. And, and by doing that, I have this code symbol with a dollar sign and a little browser window with the buttons that you might see in Safari. And I put this together in like 20 minutes or 30 minutes and, and it's good enough for me. But obviously, like we mentioned before, this is a perfect example of why you would want to ping because with the rounded edges, I have the transparency around the outside of the image. And this is only using a handful of colors. There's no gradients. There's no pixelation. It's it's very clear-cut image. So let me open up that Save for Web menu. And we once again see the whiteness of that. <laughs> but right now, we have this set as JPEG, and that's why we have the white instead of the transparency around the border because JPEG doesn't support transparency. And as a JPEG, this is 25 kilobytes. If I change that to a ping, our size drops down to 17 kilobytes. So that just shows you how ping is more optimized. And let me do GIF here just to see what the size difference is. Because like I said, I normally just go with ping if there's no animation. And it actually looks like we're saving more with a GIF file. And the last file that I have here is from a Wikipedia page. This is just the Newton's Cradle, those marbles that if you, you know, pull up the one end and hit it, it's going to be like a perpetual motion machine. And when you import a GIF into Photoshop, every frame within that image is going to turn into a layer here. 
and they have a way to edit GIF files. If you open up the window menu here and click on timeline, it'll bring down that timeline down here. And there's just so many frames here that you can't see it, but you can adjust the delay between each frame. And you can decide whether you want to loop it once, a handful of times, or loop it forever when you embed it within a website or wherever you're doing that. So right now we can play it and you can see how that GIF is animated. And I think you can edit some of these settings as well on that save for web menu that I mentioned before. So that's all I wanted to show you. You know, I hope this simplified it where you don't have to wonder anymore which file to choose. It's, it's really not that difficult once you know what each file type is best for. And before I end here, I want to mention one more file type that is new. I've, I've really seen it only in the last couple of years on websites. It probably was developed a little bit before that. I'm not sure if they put the date on this page. But it's called WebP. And it was developed by Google. And what's cool about this is that it combines both lossless and lossy compression into one format. And they say here that it's on average 26% smaller to PNGs and 25 to 34% smaller than JPEGs. So this is something that I think web servers can do dynamically on the back end, just automatically convert files when they're displaying to the browser to these formats. And I found a WordPress plugin that does this that has pretty high ratings called Dub or WebP Express. So this is something to keep an eye on in the future. But if you're looking to optimize even more than the file types we discussed in this video, WebP is probably the way to go. And if you go uh, over to this Google developer page, under the support menu, they have a plugin for Photoshop. So I haven't installed this yet. I'll probably do it after this video and test it out a little bit. But for the most part, I optimize all my images anyway, so I'm not, I'm not that concerned to save that extra 10 or 20 percent when you know I might be saving a thousand percent on the front end by going from five megabytes to a hundred kilobytes. If you are a website beginner and you'd like to get set up I got two free training series that will help you out. If you've ever used WordPress before and just want a little bit more of a broad overview and background of how everything works you can sign up for my free WordPress 101 training. Go to websiteprofitcourse.com slash WP 101 I'll link that up in the top right. I think everybody should have a blog because it's the best way to create new opportunities for yourself in this digital economy. Even if you're going for a job, a blog is better than a resume where a potential employer can see exactly what you're passionate about, get to know you on a personal level, and build that connection. Or on the flip side, if you'd like to make money online, there's no better asset than a blog because you have full control over it. You know, you, you get the domain, you get to choose the web host, you can move it around from host to host. There's nothing else online that gives you that level of control other than a blog and an email list. If all you're doing is setting up social media pages, at some point the social media algorithms are gonna change, or if you do something that's against their rules or regulations, their terms and conditions, they could potentially shut your page down and that can't happen with your own website when you own it and you have full editorial control of what gets published. So if you've never launched a blog before, I have a 14-day training series and that's going to get you set up with the fundamental steps that you need. I completely took away the design part of it. You know, you're not going to have to design a website or need to know Photoshop at a high level in order to get your website up and running. And I purposefully did that because I think that's the biggest stumbling block that people go through. They think they need to become professional web designers before they start writing. And I think it's the complete opposite. You can have the most boring design possible, but if you have great written blog posts, or even if you want to do videos or images, as long as you can tell a story in a blog, you don't need anything more than a couple photos from your phone, a few free stock photos, and good ideas. Don't worry about spending six months putting together a design that looks great when you have no audience and no readers. So if you want to get access to that free training, go to 14dayblog.com. And I will also link that up in the top right. And both of these links, along with a few others, will be down in the description below if you'd like to go take the next step. Last but not least, please give this video a thumbs up. 
and subscribe to my channel for more videos on websites, business and freelancing. As I mentioned in this video, if you have any suggestions for me and my process or why you think that my monitor might be showing two different colors within one program like Photoshop, I'm all ears to your advice. And, and you know, there's, there's a certain level of problems that you just have to deal with and not care about because if you always focus on that little stuff, you'll never put together the pieces for the big picture. I still get frustrated all the time by little errors like that that I can't catch. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things to success is just getting over your own perfectionism. Take it all one step at a time, and you'll be surprised at how far you get in three months or six months. And who knows, maybe one day you can turn your skills into a full-time income. That's really what I want everyone to go after. So thanks a lot for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you join me on the next one, and I hope you have a great day.